Amen. You may be seated. Uh, we're going to be talking today about this. What is that word? Kadoshim, which comes from the root word what? Kadosh. And Kadosh means what? Holy. Holiness. Set apart. Leviticus is all about holiness. Believe it or not, we have holy houses. Look at Leviticus 27, 14. And when a man shall sanctify his house to be what? We can set apart our houses for the Lord. And some people do that by putting the little mezuzah on the doorpost. And what is the English word for mezuzah? Mezuzah means doorpost. You should never forget, okay? That's why it's called a mezuzah, because it goes on the doorpost, and mezuzah means doorpost. But did you know both man and beast can be holy as well? Like I mentioned earlier, there's holy cows. That's what Jill mentioned earlier. She said, holy cow. Look at this verse. It says, notwithstanding, no devoted thing that a man shall devote unto the Lord of all that he has, both man and beast, and of the field of his possession shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted thing is most holy to the Lord. So even fields can be holy. It says, but the field, when it goes out in the Jubilee, shall be what? Holy unto the Lord as a field devoted. The possession thereof shall be the priest. So we can have holy beasts, holy fields, holy people, and Oh my gosh, everything is holy. Holy cows. Now look what happens when someone had a holy field. We go to the book of Acts chapter 5 verse 1 and 2. It says there was a certain man named Hananiah with his wife Sapphira and they sold something. But they kept back part of the price. This was a holy field. His wife also being aware of it and bought a certain part and laid it at the emissary's feet. But what happened? He says, why you kept it didn't remain your own, but after it was sold, wasn't it in your power? How is it that you have conceived this thing in your heart? You haven't lied to men, but to God. And Hannah and I hearing these things fell down and died and great fear came on all who heard these things. And then his wife comes in and the same thing because they had a holy field and they kept part back when everything was in their hands. Now, let me show you this. Here we have the word. What's this word? What, come on, you guys, you know this. What, what letter is this? Kuf, which has the K sound. What letter is this? Dalit, which has the D sound. Shit, kadosh. And the Torah portion begins with, you shall be kadosh. When I think about it, wow. We've got holy cows. We have holy fields. We have holy people and God says, you're supposed to be kadosh. You're supposed to be holy. And then he says, because I am holy. Look at this. Leviticus 19, 1 and 2. This is the first verse of our Torah portion. The Lord spoke to Moses and he says, speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel and say unto them, you shall be what? Holy, because I, the Lord, your God, am what? But if you look at the Hebrew that I put on your notes, look at the two different ways to spell kadosh. Yeah, what, what is the extra letter? Voth. At the top, God says, I am this kadosh, and I want you to be this kadosh. The first kadosh is perfection, and God knows we can never be perfect. So we're a little kadosh. He's the big kadosh. You're following me. But you only see that in the Hebrew. You don't see it in the English. And this verse is quoted. Look at 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. But as he which has called you, so who's that referring to? The Father, to be holy. He says, so be holy, and you're to be holy in all manner of conversation. That doesn't mean speech. That means your whole walk, okay? And everything that you do, because it is written, be holy, for I am what? Do you realize? He's quoting the Old Testament. It hasn't been done away with. He didn't say I fulfilled that so you don't have to be holy. 
It's become as a shock to most of Christianity. But we're still required to be and holy from what? Is he separating us from camels? What is he separating us from? The rest of the world. Look at Ephesians 1.4. Now, these are all New Testament verses. According as he has chosen us in him, when? Before he even created the world, he chose you. Think about that. Remember, it says uh, in Ecclesiastes 3, 1, there's a time and a, pers a purpose for everything. That means you were created on purpose. And that's even what these children of prostitution that Joe takes care of, they need to realize they have value. God created them on purpose. And it says that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, not in legalism. Ephesians 5, 27 that he might present the bride to himself, a glorious assembly, not having spot, or wrinkle, or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. The bride needs to be holy and without blemish. This is why I teach on the spots, wrinkles, and blemishes of the Old Testament, because Christians will read this. Well, what does that mean? I know I'm not supposed to have spot, wrinkles, or blemishes, but what's a spot? What is a wrinkle? What is a blemish? If you don't know what they are, that's why you have to have the, the Tanakh and the Torah. It defines what a spot is. It defines what blemishes are. The Jews understood that. They knew the Torah and the Tanakh. But the pagan Gentiles who came into this at the very beginning had no foundation. They didn't know Hebrew at all. All they had was the Greek translation, the Septuagint that only the Jews had. So they started reading it and they thought it was done away with. Look at Hebrews 12, 14. This is one of the most scariest verses in the whole Bible. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no one is going to see the Lord. And this is all New Testament verses I'm giving you guys. Look at Revelation 22, 11. He that is just, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy. And he that is righteous, let him... Be righteous, and he that is holy, let him be holy. This is important. The whole thing about this kadosh is it's a wedding covenant. This is where we get our wedding vows from. I'm holy to that person. That person's holy to me, and not for anybody else. Look at Isaiah chapter 65. Oh, let me give you one more. I love this too, because what God is asking for is for our heart. That's what he wants. And if, uh, he just says, would you give your heart to me? And he says, I want to give you my heart. What does it say? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. God, the Torah is the only thing God spoke. When you read the Torah, don't analyze it in terms of legalism or stupid stuff like that. Read it saying, wow, this is what God thinks. This is God's, I'm reading God's heart. I'm feeling God's heartbeat when I read the Torah. Okay, so everyone has the wrong person, not everyone, but for the most part, people look at the Torah as lawlessness, the whole thing, but it's all laws, but people, they don't see it as God's heart. My goodness, we have to look at it when we read it. Wow, look what God thinks. The reason why that is, how many of you know some of the famous people have stalkers, okay? The stalker thinks they love that person. The person being stalked said, get out of here. Okay, the Torah defines love. Each one of us wants to define Yeshua after our own identity, which is why you find every Yeshua from every race. Okay, but he is the one who defines holiness. We can define holiness as far as our individual is concerned, but we can't define holiness as far as God is concerned. He's the one who defines holiness. Look at Isaiah 65, 1 through 5. I am inquired of by those who didn't even ask. I am found by those who weren't even looking for me. 
And I said, look here, look here to a nation that was not called by my name. I spread out my hands all day to a rebellious people who walk in a way that isn't good. And what is the way that's not good? They walk after their own thoughts. A people who are provoking me to my face continually. They sacrifice in gardens. They burn incense on stupid bricks. They sit among the graves. They lodge in the secret places. They're eating pig's flesh and broth of abominable things in their vessels. And look at what they say. Go stand by yourself. Don't come near me for I am holier than you. There are smoke in my nose, a fire that burns all day. How many of you have ever been barbecuing and you had a burst of smoke come right in your eyes and in your nose and in your face? And that's how God thinks of people who think they're holy, holier than everybody else. We all know we are to be holy. But the problem comes when we think we're holier than everybody else. We get egotistical. And this happened within Judaism too. They thought they were holier than Gentiles and they ended up not wanting anything to do with the Gentiles. But this, uh, we can't go around thinking that we're holier than everyone else because when we do it, we do it according to our own standard. All the ladies have to wear dresses. They can't wear pants. All the ladies cannot wear makeup. All, I mean, you know what I mean? You know what I'm talking about. Or you have to put a doily on your head or something. So uh, I, I'm just saying... No pastor defines holiness. God defines holiness. <laughs> As a matter of fact, look at Isaiah 57, 15. For thus says the high and lofty one, the one who inhabits where? How do you inhabit eternity? I, I mean, there's no beginning. There's no end. How do you, <laughs> I mean, that's, he says, I dwell in high and holy place with him who is of a contrite and a humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite. Wow. It's only the humble that can dwell with him. Look at Psalm 99.3. Let them praise your great and terrible name for it is holy. Isaiah 40, 25. To whom then will you liken me, God says, or shall I be equal to, saith the who? So who is the holy one? God. Now, look at Luke 4, 33 through 34. In their synagogue, there was a man who had an unclean spirit, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying, Leave us alone, what have we to do with you, you Yeshua of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You are the Holy One. Oh my goodness, Yeshua is the Holy One of God. But like I said, God defines how we are to be holy. Look at Leviticus 19.3. This tells you how to be holy. Respect your mother and your father. What does that mean? The vast majority of people don't respect their mother or father. And God says, I want you to be different from the rest of the world. I want you to respect your mother and your father. That's how you are holy. He defines it right here. And then he says, you are to keep my what? Sabbath. And it doesn't say, I want you to keep the Jewish Sabbath. It doesn't say, I want you to keep Israel's Sabbath. It says, I want you to keep my Sabbaths. And that's not just Shabbat. His Sabbaths are Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah. Pesach, first and last day. Sukkot, first and last day. You know, these are his Sabbaths, all of them. <clears throat> In Leviticus 19, 9 and 10, when you reap the harvest of your land, don't completely reap the, even the corners of your field. How many of you have ever been on an airplane? How about when you're flying over some of those barren places, you see these big squares with round circles? that the farmer does. This is what he's talking about. When you're harvesting everything, don't reap those corners. Don't go back and reap the corners. It says, here's what you're supposed to do. And don't gather the gleanings. Don't glean your vineyard. Neither shall you gather the fallen grapes that have fallen on the ground. You have to leave them for the poor and for the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. In other words, he says, look, I'm the boss. I'm telling you, even though it is quote unquote your field, just like parents tell the child, this is your room, but it's really the parents' room. God says, I'm giving you this land. It was free. And I'm telling you, 
Don't clean the corners. Leave it for the widow. Leave it for the poor. Now, what does that tell you, that law tell you about God? He cares about the widows and the orphans. See, this is how you have to look at the Torah is look at it, what is God's heart? And then verse 11 and 12, don't steal. Don't lie. Don't deceive one another. Don't swear by my name falsely or profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. This is how you're holy, not whether or not you wear a doily on your head. Look at verse 13. Don't oppress your neighbor. Don't rob him. The wages of a hired servant will not remain with you all night until morning. Do you know what basically that means? Pay your employees on payday. What, what, what would you think if and you're, uh, you go to your boss and you say, hey, today's payday, can I have my paycheck? He goes, no, I'm not under the law. I don't have to pay you on payday. Jesus fulfilled that. Go get your money from Jesus. It doesn't work that way. Jesus fulfilled everything, not so we don't have to do it, but so we know how to do it. That's, people don't understand what the word fulfilled means. Okay, well, I'm not under the law. All right. So let's look at Leviticus 19.13. Oh, I did that. Okay, let's go to the next page. Leviticus 19.15. You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor show favoritism to the great. How many of you think that happens in politics? Uh, but you shall judge your neighbor in righteousness. That's how you are holy. Verse 16 through 18. Don't go up and down as a slanderer among your people, I am the Lord. Now, this is heavy, this next one. Do not hate your brother where? Wow, that's a tough one. Don't hate your brother in your heart. And then it says, but you shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. You've got to find the balance. Don't take vengeance. Don't bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Wow. Do you know that's the wrong translation? <laughs> I know you're shocked. Actually, it says you shall have love toward your neighbor. You need to be demonstrating love toward your neighbor, not just have it be in your heart. Oh, I feel love for my neighbor, but I'm not going to do anything for him. But here's the other thing. One is expected to enlist even the help of others if necessary to help someone in danger. And this applies to legal testimony on behalf of another. Uh, they must be silent. Not only are we commanded not to bear false witness, but we also must not withhold testimony when it will help. When a community is in trouble... A person should not say, well, I'm going home and be at peace with myself. I'm good. When you see, and I'm going to expand this now. How many of you know our nation's in trouble? Do we have the attitude of, well, that's the nation's problem. I'm good. I'm going to go home and I'm not going to try to help the nation. Yeah, they do. That's what they do, but that's not what's right. right. In the, that part of the world, it's always about the community. In our part of the world, it's always about the individual. I got my Jesus. If you don't, that's your problem. See you later. That's just, that's just the attitude of uh, so many Christians. Uh, we can't think that way. You know, Moses could have ignored his people. God told Moses, I'm going to destroy them all and make a nation out of you. And he could have said, yeah, go get them. Start over with me. Moses was concerned about the community. How about Esther? Esther was concerned about the community. I, I don't know what it's like in Korea, but here in America, it's all for me, all for one. It's not about the community or in Russia or Ukraine, you know, these other places or South America. We have people from every nation here just about. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> if Think about this for a minute. Here's a heavy statement. If one can stop the sins of the whole world from sinning. 
and does not, then they are held responsible for the sins of the whole world. Which is why God sent Yeshua. Do you get that? This is heavy. How many of you have heard of Ellie Weissel? He was uh, caught in the Holocaust. Okay, he is there in the Holocaust camps. And after, well, even at the time, it says that he harshly chastised bystanders who were indifferent to the persecution and the deportation of Jews during the Holocaust. Listen to what he said. The victims suffered more and more profoundly from the indifference of the onlookers than from the brutality of the executioner. They, they couldn't believe who they thought they loved and were friends were indifferent toward them. That caused more pain than the brutality of the executioner. The cruelty of the enemy would have been incapable of breaking the prisoner. It was the silence of those he believed to be his friends which broke his heart. That's what he said. And we're at that place today. Look at what's going on. Are we going to be a bystander with what's going on in Israel? Or are we going to do? Now, I just added this this morning. And this is very profound, not because I'm saying it, but because it's true. History is about man's conquest of space. We want lots of land. We want more space. We want more land. We want more material goods. All of history is replete about man's conquest of space. And I don't mean outer space. I'm talking about land or a house. You want a bigger house. You want more space. All right. We spend all of our time trying to acquire more space because we have more goods. Remember the parable in the Gospels. I'm going to tear down these brand new barns. I'm going to build bigger barns for, you know. Now, here's the thing. Where is God? Where, this God who inhabits eternity, where is he? Well, think about this. We try to find God in some space. We build a church and God is in the church. We're trying to find God in some space Okay, or we try to find him in nature. We worship the trees, the mountains. We worship the stars. But we have to understand he's not a thing. So he's not found in necessarily a space because he's everywhere. We can't find him in space or in nature as if he were a thing. We find him in nature time, in history, in the present, and in the future. How many of you know when you go someplace, you forget a lot of it, but what you remember is personal encounters? What makes it come alive is when you have an experience or an encounter, and we have those experiences or encounters in time, which is why God created all of the Moedim so we could experience him in time, in history, in the past. <laughs> Isn't this incredible when you think about it? Now listen, the knowledge of God doesn't come with a wealth of more knowledge. The knowledge of God comes by sacred moments in time. Look, at, I mean, think about it. Revival or whatever it is, God was there at a point in time. So we need to try to experience God in time. Not just in space, okay? Not in nature, looking for God in nature. Sure, the heavens declare the glory of God. But you want to experience God. It's that moment when, oh my gosh, God is real. Does that make sense? Holiness. And what is the title of this Torah portion? Kedoshim which means holiness. What was the first thing that was made holy? Time, the Sabbath. The first thing God sanctified was time and he created a calendar before man was even created. Now, after that, 
The next thing that was made holy was people. And the last thing to meet ho made holy was space. Okay, he, time was holy first. Then he said, I want you to be holy. And then he said, I want you to create a holy place. So we need the Sabbath is to, is a, the Sabbath is a celebration of time. Rather than space. The Sabbath has nothing to do with the moon. The Sabbath has nothing to do with nature. The months are controlled by the moon. The year is controlled by the sun. The Sabbath is controlled by nothing other than God said it. I mean, you have the people that are the lunar Sabbath. I call it the loony Sabbath. But it's not based on the moon. It's completely separate. The Sabbath is basically an act of creation completely detached from the world of space. It's about time. And I'm out of it. <laughs> so let me just go real quick. I'm going to jump through. Uh, I'll make the rest of this real fast. In Luke 10, 27 through 29, God asks this guy, what's the greatest commandment? And he mentions them. And then uh, he wanted to justify himself. And he says, who's my neighbor? Well, go back and read Leviticus 19. Okay. It tells you who your neighbor is. Look at Leviticus 19, 33 and 34. If a stranger dwells with you in your land, you shall not mistreat him. The stranger who dwells among you will be to you as one born among you. And you shall love him as yourself. We have to love the stranger. And then Leviticus 20, verse 7. And notice, he always, after all these commandments, he says, because I'm the Lord your God. I'm the boss. This is why you have to do it. Leviticus 20, verse 7. Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be holy. I am the Lord your God. You keep my statutes and you do them. I'm the Lord who sanctifies you. I'm the one who makes you holy. Now, you can have grandma's dishes and you can make them holy and not use them, but you can use your own dishes, but that doesn't make them holy to me. They're only holy to you. And you can have your own Sabbath whenever you want. That's great. I don't care. But it's not God's Sabbath. It's your Sabbath. That's the difference. Leviticus 20, verse 7. Yeah, basically God sanctifies you. Leviticus 19, 30. Keep my Sabbath. Reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Leviticus 20, 23 through 26. Uh, it's about <clears throat> uh, food, what you eat and don't eat. It says in bold underline, you should be holy to who? Me, for I, the Lord, am holy. So these are the things that separates us. Uh, finally, in the Hoff Torah is from the book of Amos, which is most incredible, especially this last chapter. But look at verse 9, 8 through 10. Look at the uh, very last verse. It says, all the sinners of who? It doesn't say all of the heathen, all of the nations. It says all of my own people who are sinners are going to die by the sword who say evil won't overtake or meet us. I won't have evil overtake me because I got Jesus in my pocket and I just pull him out and I hold up my Jesus flag. Don't work that way, guys. Now look at Amos 9:11. We're going to close basically with this and compare it to Acts 15. It says, in that day, I will raise up the tent of David, which has fallen, and close up the breaches. I'll raise up the ruins. I'll build it as in the days of old. Now look at this. That they may possess the remnant of what? Edom. And all the nations who are called by my name. Do you realize there's going to be nations that are going to be called by God's name? The sheep nations. But do you know what? The Septuagint, the Greek translation of that verse, look how they wrote it. In Acts 15, they quote this verse, and it's different. Here this says the remnant of Edom. When you hear Edom, what do you think of? When you hear Edom. Esau. Bad. Ooh. But now look at Acts 15, how they quote it differently. Here they say, uh, third line down, after this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and will build again the ruins thereof. I will set it up that the remnant of mankind... Not the residue of Edom, but the remnant of mankind might seek after the Lord and all those nations upon whom my name is called. Wow, is it Edom or Adam? Here's the word. Now, if you see this, this is like the A, the D, and the M. 
It can be Adam or it can be Edom, depending on the vowel points. And there were no vowel points. So it could be translated either way. But in the context of this, we see, we know from Zechariah 14, almost all the nations are going to be destroyed when the Messiah comes. But the remnant of those people are going to come and seek the Lord. So this is what's heavy. This prophecy is predicting the reestablishment of the house of David in the days of Yeshua. There had not been a member of the house of David sitting on the throne. There was, so it couldn't have been then. There was no house of David since it fell. The passage predicts that when David's throne is reestablished, there will be a remnant of people from all nations calling upon God's name. And those early Jewish believers witnessed how God was miraculously working among Gentiles in a way never before seen. They observed that God was bringing many Gentiles into their midst and understood that what God was doing with the nations was a direct fulfillment of the words of the prophet Amos. Therefore, they saw this verse was not intended for some future millennial reign. Rather, they saw that already in their day, God was bringing many Gentiles into the house of David or into the family of the Messiah. And it has been going on for the last 2,000 years or two days. You are living in the days of prophecy right now. Let's stand. And let's pray. Avino Makeno, our Father King, we just thank you so much that we can come and learn of you. We pray, Lord, that you continue to open our eyes, our ears, our hearts, that we can not only see and understand, but we would have a heart to obey. Father, we just want to thank you so much for all those who want to be a light to the nations, who invest in your kingdom. It's not ours, it's yours. It's all about you. We're just here to serve you. And Father, thank you for those who bring any tithes or offerings through this ministry to build your kingdom that we will once again, even as you ask in Isaiah, to magnify the law and make it honorable once again. In Yeshua's name, amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living work by the power of your Holy Spirit, through the completed work of Messiah, Yeshua, you alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. Grab a flower if you want one, mothers.